Education for the Town of Scarborough. It's January 22nd, 2015. Um, could we please have attendance? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mr. Diazzo? Here. Mr. Ling? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Mrs. Murray? Mrs. Hartle? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. just to ensure that um, we're uh, sensitive to people's times. Um, uh, there is, um, I want to change the order of seven and eight so that we're discussing the personnel matters first and then followed by the motion to discuss the bargaining contract. So now, um, after item seven, personnel matters, the board will briefly return to public session but only to move into executive session for the new item eight, which is uh, the bargaining contract discussion. Um, that would be the adjustment. Okay, for new, new business, we have uh, a bunch of policies. Reading of policy AD, educational philosophy and mission. So, a lot of these, um, I guess in the last meeting, there were not, um, we didn't make any changes to this reason. We we're just trying to go through to make sure that they're all up to date, and some of them had not been updated on websites since the website had changed over. So, we just were doing a really thorough check all the way through. So, um, AD is educational philosophy and mission, and that was. Um, Virtually unchanged. Just a review. You want to do them all at once or one, one by one? Can you do one um, by yeah, one? Yeah, could you just kind of go through so that there's anything you want to add to each one? Okay, so do you want to vote on them individually? Yeah. yeah. I have got two questions. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll do them one by one. That's fine. Okay. okay. So anyway, AD was just a review. So there's no change. So. Do we need to vote on that if it hasn't changed? The first, the first, the first, the first, the first reading, so. No, we're not changing it. But it's already on that the was, That was a question we had for we're changing the revision there to get the revision so it shows that it. Okay. Did the new second reading, if it was just a review, that was the question we had? Yes, I If it's just I mean, a review or not a review. Possibly in a formal sense, but it, you're really not substantively changing anything. In some ways, it's a. It's a like a uh, insignificant or non-substantial change, you can probably, I mean, you can just update the date of review. The committee has, has reviewed it. The board is, knows about it. They've reviewed it. It can be a done deal, I think. So first reading only for the ones that we just reviewed? The first and second reading together, basically. Okay. And then I would say that's it for first and second reading. <laughs> so Oh, the approval of presenter? So 
school department goals and objectives. Yeah, just a comment. Um, we're no longer doing the 18 month improvement, right? Is the, isn't that time extended out now? So it's beyond 18 months? And we may want to either make note of that or correct that. I, I don't have a problem with it. I just, it, it states that it's 18 months. So I don't know if we want to keep it that way. If we just want to say community involvement or make it more. Yeah. Or you could say call it an 18 to 24 month. It's not likely to get any shorter or any longer than that. Right. So that might just cover it. So we could just add the 24 to that one, and then we can bring that one back for? Again, it's not a. Not necessary. Okay. It's, it's not a, uh, so a substantive change. Okay. okay, so all in favor? Six. And BDE board standing committee. This one does have some changes. when we were sitting down to talk about this one was that there are a lot of things in policy that would be better suited to uh, school board member handbook and we currently don't have some of these liaisons so we thought um, those would be as needed so that's why we added the 8.0 other committee assignments would be assigned. Any questions? Yeah. Um, Capital improvements, was that long range planning or was that a different thing, a different issue? Capital improvements I, As far as I know, that was different. That was different. I, I don't know how or why, but I, I don't. We, it was for a C, CIP. Okay. So it wasn't really a long range planning. It was one that we do with the CIP. And okay, my question is that we now, we now do the CIP budget along with the regular budget. Right. So the it's overseen by the finance by the finance committee. It's correct. The function of the, and the finance function of the CIP committee was to review. I I served on it. It was to review uh, the technology submissions for CIP and the maintenance. <coughs> uh, what am I saying? Whatever maintenance projects uh, that Todd had, and and those. Items are now part of the general review of the total budget. So that would be the rationale, in my opinion, why it's being removed as a standing committee. It just makes sense to streamline it so it all stays with finance so that it's a bigger picture. Okay. Um, do we have a curriculum liaison? I didn't hear you, Do we have a curriculum liaison? We also discussed that. Right. And I think the feeling was that if, as long as we, you know, we're hearing from the school department in terms of curriculum, what direction they were going into, we wanted to be able, didn't we put a sentence in at the very end saying we wanted to be able to? It um, just says, says, shall be informed by the director of curriculum for the final review and selection of the textbook. Um, and instructional materials, including technology for recommendation to the board as a whole. So I think you were the curriculum liaison. Where did you read that from, Christine? I, I did some of that. Yeah. PLA yeah, with PLA, PLA and the writing program. That was two three years ago. So that's seven point six curriculum liaison. Do you see that? Yeah. So there wasn't any additional text added. It was just no, the no, that was already there. Okay. So, but we thought that one um, would be an as necessary, but it's no harm because it shall be informed. It's not a committee. It's just one person. So. And at one point there was full-fledged curriculum committee made up of board members, administrators, and teachers, mm -hmm. and parents. Yeah, my, my concern is just we, I want to reference something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be there and it's not going to be functionally utilized. I don't want somebody outside reading that thinking, right. there's a curriculum liaison, I want to talk to that person, and it's not really a function. Maybe that's under the other the other committee assignments, because that was something that came up that yeah, has changed to LA time to time. Yeah, and I, I was also going to suggest maybe an 8.0 other committee assignments. I, I, I wasn't sure if because it's under the standing committee section or it was 
right after whether that was an ad hoc or maybe ch adding just ad hoc or something that gives us a little fun more flexibility. Because it sounds, to, reading that, it almost sounded like we're going to create new committees at the, whenever we feel like it. Oh, okay. You see what I mean? That so wasn't like, I, I didn't I didn't think it was, but I was. Board assignments, maybe you say? Because that's like when we needed to have like something on an interview or, or something. Sure. something yeah. or, I mean, I would just think adding ad hoc or some some reference to that as a temporary assignment or something might just. I'm trying to read this from outside the group. To, mm -hmm. If I read this, what does this really mean? Mm -hmm. Jackie, did you want to? Yes, I do. Uh, I think it should be there because it is one of the responsibilities of the board is to approve curriculum. And I think that there should always be a representative from the board uh, anytime curriculum is new curriculum is being discussed. And whether it's in the technology field, the textbook field, or whatever it happens to be, uh, I think that, that that, as stated, should continue and, and be active. But it's not I think everyone agrees that that's, that's yeah. yeah, but it's not a particular person. So it's not like every month when you come around right. on the first Thursday of the month and you go down your committee assignments, you're not, right. you know, so. Because it only comes up when there's a curriculum change. So like, yeah. I, I think it is appropriate that it moves around. Like Christine, right. when you did the LA, yeah, you talked to the other ones. And so I think right. it, as things come up, you kind of just look and see who's got some time. And I, I think we could either move it to the responsibility, another responsibility area of the administration or something to inform the board, or, or what we could do is just say, at uh, curriculum liaison at the discretion of the chair or something. Or a temporary one, or, or per debate, or whatever. However, we yeah, word it so it doesn't look our SD. Right. Yeah. So it's not a permanent standing no. no. five. No. So you right. yeah. on that one. But, and just to provide an explanation, it was very common in the school di districts, but this was years ago, that they would go in a five content area cycle. Mm -hmm. And they would do science one year, English language arts the uh, next, and this, that, and the other, and then come back and cycle again. And at that point, that was, I mean, it was, I don't know, I suppose it was efficient or it was just the way to do it. Um, and we have, we have found that, you know, we are so informed by data to look at where curriculum needs to be adjusted. Um, and Monique, I think, has done a fabulous job of certainly included, including um, our teachers in evaluating all of the, the curriculum. And I know that the two, both the two of you have been involved in certain uh, uh, curriculum selections. It's a very thoughtful process. I, I think it should stay in there. It is really more an ad hoc committee assignment when um, when uh, when uh, uh, Monique and the and the teachers are at a certain point of, of really um, looking closely at materials and making a curriculum decision. Um, as Jackie said, it is part of the, you know the board determines the program of studies essentially in the in the district. So there would be a curriculum connection. And again, I, I think it's working. Well, the way that it's working, we appreciate the input, and um, and uh, but Chris's point is uh, that it does move on to an eight, so it moves beyond kind of standing committee assignments, whatever it was called here, standing committees. And I think that you know it could really be more a seven point eight, eight, which would say other ad hoc committee assignments will be made as needed. And then I think you're get rid of that confusion of the, of the formatting piece, and, um, and in some ways, um, it also covers the fact that things like curriculum are moving to much more ad hoc assignments rather than regular assignments. So move that curriculum liaison seven point six to make that an eight? No, I, I just leave that, at, I mean, leave it where it is. I would leave it, and then 7.7, yeah. 7. then 7.8 7. could be okay. other committee assignments will, other ad hoc committee assignments will be made as is necessary. Okay. Did you change? I was like, wait, no, one of these changed and one didn't. I was on the wrong one. OK. 
Okay, EDAA, change. So, we have had an issue with buses having to make turnarounds in dangerous tight spots, and including um, there was concern about the new neighborhoods that are being developed that are very narrow streets with not a lot of space to maneuver even for cars, and if there's even a single car parked on the side of the road, buses have difficulty getting down. Lots of parents drive their cars to bus stops when it's cold or infant weather. So we needed to add some kind of reasonableness standard to it, um, that if it was unsafe for a bus to go down the street and turn around, because what happens in some cases is a bus gets into a tight place, has to make a three-point turn, there are kids coming that are running to the bus because they're late, or their parents parked and they're snow banks, and it just becomes a very dangerous and difficult situation for the bus drivers. So what we wanted to add was um, required walking distances may exceed distances stated, so further than the um, quarter mile for primary kids and half mile for um, middle and high school may exceed distances stated due to safety concerns, remote locations, or near proximity. So if they're, even if it's safe to turn around at the end of a street, if it's within 500 feet either way, we're not gonna have the bus drive down there anymore. It's kind of just a, a reasonableness, really. But what we were calling it in the policy committee is that if you're just a few feet over the quarter mile, we're still gonna have the one bus stop because buses are having a hard time getting to school on time and it's more developments every day and not any more buses, so. It's a safety issue. I think well, all that makes perfect sense. Uh, what I, my comment or my, what I noticed in this was, I think we should spell out who makes that determination because that because what will happen is mm -hmm. we'll get into a situation, does the bus driver think it's unsafe? Is it is it Sue, is it Joanne? Who makes that determination? And then, then the people know outside of the organization of, if this person has decided that we, we support that decision, that's their part of their professional judgment, and it's not a committee or an opinion. It's, you know what I mean. It's some, it's some that authority should should be stated where that lies, where that decision. <coughs> then, if they don't like that. We can start another process, but. So, is there a particular line there where you wanted to add that? I had it in paragraph six, which was the the turnaround part, and or so, so no to the private way, no Scarborough bus. School bus shall enter any public way that is determined to be unsafe. Yeah. You might want to just say determined to be unsafe by the transportation director or by the superintendent or the designee or something like that. Well, further down, there's talk yeah, of the um, bus committee. I saw that, but I also saw like that. That again, I, I was confused. Is that a once a year meeting that happens just to discuss general policy, or is that a a, a, a situational type of committee that gets together? It does both. Right. So that committee would determine if a, if a road is unsafe, not Sue Redman or Sarah. I'm Sarah, sorry, not Sarah. I think that's something that would come to the committee. Yes. Have okay. either a ride along or look at the map or whatever. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But maybe we should just take that up there too. Or, or, or some other word that says all decisions regarding safety are the responsibility of this committee. Or, so just so people, because when I read that, I'm like, well, who makes that determination that it's unsafe? Because you could have a situation where a parent might think it's perfectly safe, or the opposite. We may think it's safe, a parent might be complaining that it's unsafe, so they want the bus stop moved. Well, further down, though, it does say that the program is under the direction of the transportation supervisor who is responsible to the superintendent or but the designee. I think which is different than the committee, though. Correct. I think Chris is just looking for a sense to be added just determination, I think it helps to, to call who makes that determination. So if somebody reads it without knowing the process, we'll be able to read that in regular language. I'm just going to forward all my calls to your house, Jackie. It's no problem. Right. <laughs> They'll be walking four miles. Paragraph <laughs> 7B, which really didn't change, but it's kind of a similar... Yeah, it says when a student 
would be exposed to a hazardous walking conditions defined as those that would place a child at a given age in a situation greater than normal or average, normal or average age. Again, who would determine that? Is that's that the committee? That's, that's, that's the, the safety committee. Again. Okay. So that is, um, in this situation, for instance, it's the not written policy, but the policy in the transportation department that a road like Broad Turn Road, kids don't walk. If there could be three kids in a row living on Broad Turn Road, they stop at each driveway because mm -hmm. that is an unsafe street for kids to be walking on. Black Point, Black Point, Black Point, you know, Holmes Road, any of those that are Black double Point. yellow line, kind of um, no shoulder, no sidewalk. Um, Again, so, I, that just, I, I that's, know, an, I that's an interpretive thing. That's why I want it, you know, we interpret it or mean it a certain way, and I think it should should really state that in the policy as opposed to having an open-ended thing where we may feel it's okay, or, or again, an opposite situation come up. A, a parent might think it's an unsafe bus stop for whatever reason, and then there's nothing in here that says, they could come and say, I want the bus stop changed because it's unsafe. So should we just move mm -hmm. up that safety panel exactly. to the top of the exactly. policy? Yeah. So that's all that then, sure. that's the first thing you read? Yeah. Or one of the first things? I, and I do think that um, the, the initial determination should be made by the transportation coordinator, and you know when and and when there's uh, you know conflict or confusion or uncertainty, it would be reviewed by the safety. Committee. But so that should safety. that should be written out and spelled yeah. out in the policy, so that when people read it for the first time, they know what yeah. needs to happen. Yeah. If I have a problem, I'm going to call this person. Right. And right. Then, yeah. This, if my right. problem persists, I'm right. calling next person and then right. they all have to it's, be It have just to ends be. up being the very last paragraph of the entire policy and maybe just needs to be brought forward. Gotcha. 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 This probably requires a second reading. Yes. Yeah. Any further discussion on that one? Very, very 
committed to that from us. I, I just I didn't want to start that debate because <laughs> it's a long one. Um, I just yeah right, I know I just wanted to make sure this the, it wasn't purposely left out. I'm not in, I didn't interpret it properly, so it's it's in there. It's not meant to be exclusive of that. Right. That so I'm I'm happy and content. We, can, we will definitely save that discussion, Jackie, for another day. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Because it's likely to come up again. Yeah. You think so? <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> I know so. Any other discussion on this item? All in favor? Six. Is this a first hand session? Yes. First hand session. Yes. Okay. Okay. E G A D. Copyright. Copyright compliance. That is unchanged. So it's not that they're not going to just come to the board and say, here's our schedule, moving on. We're, we still have to approve that schedule, correct? Yes. Well, that's what, that's what, that's what Big Point said. Policy will present the proposed calendar to the board. It will be a first and second meeting. So that would seem to more, make, make more sense to take it out of here and move it to that one. So. Good point. Six. Adult debt. I'm 
GEB. This was just a review. No changes? No changes. I had some, had some I just a couple of questions. Yeah, it looks like, oh, sorry. Do we want to move for I, I move approval as presented? Are we going to do first and second with this as well? Because there's no, unless something happens. I would just say first. You can second. I'll second it. It's first reading, not first and second. All right. So for first reading, amended. Thank you. All right. So what's your question? My, I have a second. I'll, I'll second it. I'll second you want to go first? I can. You first. You All right. My, my question was, I was under the impression that if somebody went to adult education, they were getting a GED and not a Scarborough High School diploma. So I guess my question is, mm -hmm. to receive the Scarborough High School diploma, what are the parameters? I mean, could I be 25 and be showing up at adult education? Getting the diploma like my daughter received last June that said Scarborough High School. Yes. Okay. Yep, you can get it both. You can do both ways. Uh, they don't call it GED anymore, they call it HISAT, H S S A T, the name. But you can get an academic uh, Scarborough High School diploma through this pathways, or you can get a HISAT, um, formerly the GED program, and another pathway. Okay. That I had a question. 1.1 looked very, very similar to 2.0 to me, unless I'm reading that wrong as well. Like it was just the same wording, but just a little. No, 2.0 is saying the director of adult ed will establish the regulations. And then the 1.1 one one says the board of directors of adult ed to establish such regulations consistent. Oh, so you're saying 1.1 under the 1.1. Yeah, 1.1 sounds like very much the same thing as 2.0. I'm reading it wrong. Well, that's saying the well, that's board, saying is, the board is telling the director of adult ed to establish. And then it says the So it keeps board authority, school board authority. And under two, it's the state requirements that are going to It's kind of policy language. Okay. It's like the board, the board, will, the board will direct the, the uh, director of adult education, and then it restates again, then the director of adult education we'll do it. will yeah. do it. We'll do it. Okay. Understand. It's a, it's a bit of a redundancy, for sure. But, but the no, 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 it's 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 it. Yeah. <laughs> a copy from what Drevin and Woodson yeah. require. Well, I'm sure. Uh, so then the director, though, is an employee of Established, um, and since Jen has been with us, we've been fortunate to have Jen with us. A, an update on IT, basically, we call it cost and benefit analysis. Um, Jen is uh, really giving again a bit of a mm, 1,000 foot 
um, overview of the work that has been done to date and is projecting and looking at the, um, the IT uh, work that she has planned over the course of the next year. And we can't do that without including um, at least a status update on the proposal development for one to one at the high school. So I guess I would just warn everyone that this is all that is. It's not the presentation of a one to one proposal. It's a status update on where we are and the development of that proposal. And that is really just a subcomponent of um, the projections that. Um, of the work to be done that, that uh, Jen will talk about and in terms of uh, going forward. So not to work in progress. We're still sort of growing organically as we go. Um, just to give you an overview of kind of where we were in 2014, 2015. Okay. Uh, 2014, 2015 obviously was consumed by Woodward. We did do a lot of other things that I'll go into, um, particularly in terms of district-wide initiatives, but really Wentworth is sort of all-consuming for the whole staff. Um, 2015, 2016, we're really going to concentrate on moving things to the cloud, trying to move um, things off of our internal resources to sort of free up some resources there, um, take advantage of some of the free services that like Google Apps for Education has and some, some other things. Um, and then I'll give you an overview of kind of where we are to date with the high school one-to-one. -one. So in 2014, 2015, obviously went worse. Um, we went to planning sessions that extended far beyond this point at this time last year. Um, we were at that point kind of discussing what we were going to put in for infrastructure and for end-user equipment. Um, when I say end user equipment, I'm talking about both for the classroom equipment, for the staff, and for the students. Um, once we got done with that, we went into negotiating and purchasing, which was a little harder than <laughs> I think everybody thought it was going to be. Um, but we did find some things that um, had needed some massaging in the budget, so we did take care of that. Um, we did the infrastructure build, meaning we did everything from cable it from the ground up in the projectors, um, we put in all of the interactive email boards, um, we literally built the carts as they came off the truck, I think we had about 70 of those. Um, we received and then configured all the end user equipment, so we had one-to-one um, -one laptops as you all know, we also had cover cams, which are those individual document cameras, um, we had printers, we had projectors, we had, you know, copier scanners, all kinds of so that was all received and configured. Um, and then we actually moved into sort of the deployment phase, which entailed a lot of end user training. And that end user training, I never say, you know, has stopped. That's really an ongoing process. At the same time, we moved into troubleshooting and maintenance. Um, I think we, we really, at that point, by the time we deployed, we were in pretty good shape. So we didn't really have a whole lot of troubleshooting that we had to do. It's more the training, it's the ongoing training all the time. Because if you think about a school of you know, roughly 800 kids and staff, it's going in, training all the teachers, then going in and training every single student. So we have a really phenomenal group that goes out and does that. Um, and that's ongoing. We'll be doing that every single year, just like at the middle school. If anybody here has middle school kids, we do have to go in every single year. We have meetings with the parents. We have to train the parents as well on sort of best practices, safety, security, and then we go into each classroom and train the, the kids. And we do refresher training with, you know, all the staff as well. At the same time, Wentworth, just as a reminder, Wentworth was moving into things that we had already covered with the rest of the district, like a new telecom system that had already launched, but we still had to train them on that. Um, the new centralized printing solution. Everybody else was already up and running on that. We had to go in and train them on that. So it was, I have to give a lot of credit to the Wentworth folks because they had a ton of stuff thrown at them and they really used to handle it well. Uh, at the middle school, we continued on with MLTI, um, ongoing training sessions. We tried back um, in 2013, 2014, <coughs> right here, like HP day. And we had HP, but we had some other vendors come in and actually conduct training sessions with the staff. 
and we kind of ran it like a conference, like you would have different tracks and you could ahead of time sign up for different things. And so that worked really well because in terms of professional development, it really helped the teachers understand how to integrate the technology into the classroom curriculum. So we um, sort of tried something like that again this year. We did a half day, but we did it district wide, and I think it, it worked out really well. Um, we are planning to, we haven't done this yet, but we're looking into and sort of prepping to have a number of folks on the IT staff become HP technicians, certified technicians. So what that means is we would have a number of people go through the HP um, training course provided free at no charge. HP provides these courses where we can train folks to do sort of the smaller break and fix issues. Um, not because it's really costing us anything at this point to send them out, because we did outfit these with warranties, but because it takes time that we really can't have those devices out of the hands of the kids. So we're going to go in and probably have three or four people trained as technicians, and then we'll be able to hopefully um, fix the brakes right on site and have turn them around in much quicker time. Um, we did, the, now we're sort of moving into the lessons learned, which um, sort of focuses on the imaging process for the machines. So essentially when I'm talking about imaging, we're talking about when you take a machine at the end of the year, we clean it, we completely wipe it of everything, and then we have to load that image back on. So you're loading you know, your operating system, your operating software, all of that kind of stuff back onto the machine. Because we work through a third party called ENA, there were some lessons that we had to learn about how to um, bundle that software together. And we had to work with some of the outside vendors that provided the software to help us create the called MSI, so to help us create these bundles to be able to remotely push them out. But so we learned a lot of lessons that I think we can carry forward, not just with the middle school, but also with Wentworth, because now we have 800 machines there that we have to remotely push software out to. And if we were to go forward with the high school, we would also be able to manage those devices centrally um, from the console that we purchased for WebRun. At the high school, we did um, sort of in conjunction with the one-to-one -one research we were doing, we had a part of Chromebooks already for another purpose. So what we decided to do was, while those were not in use for this other purpose, we decided to deploy them out to a couple of different classrooms at the high school to actually have those teachers pilot the use of one-to-one -one devices. So not necessarily Chromebooks, that's, that's what we happen to have, but we just sort of wanted to see how are they gonna use these devices, this technology, to integrate it into the curriculum in the classroom. Would it be useful, would it not be useful? We invited feedback from them, we invited feedback from the students, so far, it's been an, an amazing test. We've gotten great feedback. Um, we also put in a couple of interactive projectors, just sort of um, spot tested them through the high school folks that are particularly tech savvy. Um, again, we've had really, really good feedback from them. And a couple of the, the um, folks who are piloting the Chromebooks are also piloting the interactive projectors. So it's sort of all working in conjunction together. Um, we did go ahead and replace all of the wireless access points in the building because they were aging. We had huge dead spots, and you know we were sort of all consumed with both Wentworth and then prior to that the middle school. And unfortunately, the high school sort of kept falling further and further behind. So anybody who has high school kids who was ever at the high school in the library or the gym or the auditorium trying to get any kind of activity couldn't do it. So now we replace the wireless APs. Um, we've put in some sort of beefier wireless APs, but also we've put in more of them. So that infrastructure has been completely upgraded, mostly just because it hit end of life. Um, but it would be ready for a one-to-one -one program if we were to move forward with it. Um, we did also start a high school tech team. And this group is a group of teachers. They are representative of each area um, discipline in the high school. They come together about once a month with folks from the IT team and folks from central office and from the high school admin. And 
we talk about tech issues, initiatives, um, tech problems, we talk about what they're piloting, um, they give us great feedback, we also collect feedback from the students, and that was really the group that we used um, primarily to do the one-to-one -one research, which I'll get to after all of this. So district-wide initiatives, you'll notice that K2 does not have a slide of their own, but because we did go in and do some things in the K2 buildings, um, but they were also initiatives that we did district-wide. So one of them, I hope you all noticed the website. Very excited about that. We have gotten um, great feedback from the public about that. I think it's much easier to navigate. Um, we are still in the process, although we've, we're about 95% there, of going out and training folks in each department at each phase level to update their own pages. So we'll, we'll get there as soon as, it's really now kind of when they have time to meet with us, but then we train them. And the feedback that I've gotten from folks in the field is that the Google interface is actually very easy to use. So I think as they learn, they're starting to update their own information, their pages. Um, just to put your minds at, at ease, we do have sort of very consistent rules and parameters that they have to follow. So just because you have access to update pages doesn't mean you can go you know, crazy and kind of post whatever you want. And we do spot check it frequently. Um, but the, the, from the end user perspective, we have gotten great feedback that it's much easier to navigate. People like the user interface. Um, they find, they're able to find the information they need much quicker. Um, we are continuing, we started last year with cloud adoption. And like I said, that's really trying to move a lot of the strain that's on our internal resources off into the, the cloud. Um, meaning Google, but a couple of other applications. So Google is what we have really focused on in this past year. We have a couple of internal drives, and we have set a deadline date in February that all staff must have all of the information located in their G drive moved into Google. Um, we've had training sessions, we've had you know refresher courses, we have online videos, we have uh, folks who go out to the field and just do one-on-one -on -one training and people are having a difficult time. But for the most part, what we've heard is it's very easy to use and people love it because they have access to it. That said, um, I, as most of you know, used to be an information security officer for a financial institution and I happen to be very paranoid about information security. So we did look into for confidential documents. So meaning documents that would store a social security number, health records, you know, any kind of student information that would not generally be public information. We did decide to go with a solution called Huddle. And I think I've told you about Huddle in the past, but Huddle is basically a confidential, um, a confidential Google. It's, it's an online cloud-based storage um, and collaboration source. And essentially, it encrypts all the data. So it'll encrypt it in at rest, it'll encrypt it in transit, um, so we can kind of all you know, sleep easier at night knowing that it's, it's stored safely. That we are rolling out now. So Google is kind of 95% there, and Huddle is probably about 30% there. What I hope is by the time we start the next school year, we will be completely free of all internal drives. So everything that would be stored, including all confidential documents, will actually be stored in these two sort of containers. Um, online testing deployment, we're being forced to go in that direction. Um, we are meeting with sort of our cohorts from other school districts to, you know, compare notes and make sure that we're all prepared in terms of bandwidth, in terms of um, hardware requirements, and basically in terms of training for kids. I'm sure Monique would be happy to fill you in more on that. So we have done some testing in different schools to make sure that we can handle the load. I'm pretty confident that we can. Time will tell. Um, Centralized printing and cloud integration. This is something that we talked about before, but, um, and there was some resistance initially. I think now the staff is really starting to warm up to it. For one big reason, which is 
moving away from an individual printer on everybody's desk, okay, we all know how much that costs in terms of ink and repairs and replacements. So we really wanted um, to, for basically for cost savings and, and kind of productivity and efficiencies, we moved to a centralized print solution. And that was paper cut, which everybody makes fun of the name, but um, the paper cut solution, instead of when you send a print job, instead of sending it like you would traditionally from your desktop to a specific printer, and then having to figure out which printer it was, because if you're in a building like you know the um, middle school, you might have 15 different printers, and nobody ever knows which one's coded what. Um, you just send it to print. It sits on a server, and at this point in time, you can go anywhere in the district and pull that print job. So if you are from the, the from Wentworth, I can't say the middle school because the middle school is sort of its own beast. But we are we're working on that just because it's on its own network um, because of MLTI. Um, if you're at Wentworth and you're in a meeting at central office or you're meeting, let's say you're a meeting at the high school, you can send something to print and pick it up at the high school. You don't have to know what printer you're sending it to or anything like that. So we are trying to staff like that because if you go to the printer that's closest to you and it's busy, you can walk to the next printer down the hall and pick it up. There's a paper jam there, you can go someplace else and get it. Um, one of the things, though, obviously we're trying to get people not to print things. So one of the things that we are working on and we are piloting right now is a scan to their Google Drive option. Um, this is, it's called the I option, and we're piloting it at the middle school and at the high school. From what I understand, the middle school folks actually really are, like it a lot because you can take documents. Um, let's say you get something in the mail and you want to scan it in, or you get have some kind of lesson plan and you want to scan it in. Um, you can scan it in directly to your Google Drive, and then from there you can share it out for collaboration. So hopefully this could be something that we can deploy district-wide, but we're still piloting it. Um, I think in the end it's going to provide a lot of cost savings. Um, we did configure, this is where in the K2s, you can hear, I think they were happy, we configured every projector in the district to be wireless. So no more having to plug in to um, your HDMI cable anymore. You can come in as long as you've been configured to connect to the system. You can come in, connect to it, and then um, it's given the teachers a lot of mobility within the classroom because if you have a tablet or you have even your laptop We've heard from people that that's given that that mobility has given them a lot of flexibility in the classroom. Um, we are also working on social media. I know there's been a lot of questions, not just on the school side, but on the town side as well, about social media. You know, we're on a Facebook page, we're going to have Dr. Ann Whistle tweet things out. Wish I had to get. So we're we're working on a policy because we really I think we have the modes of the policy, but um, we need to make sure that all of those procedural things are kind of in place, and then we'll start kind of working on how how this is going to roll out. Um, a lot of teachers have also requested that they have websites, individual teacher websites. A lot of them already do, so we're trying to work with them to actually make them consistent. And my one of my main concerns as a parent was all these teachers that had different websites, which was great because I could go right to their website and see what the curriculum was and see what was due next and see what the reading material was. But I kind of wanted something, just one page up front that was the same for everybody. So as I hit each teacher's page, I would know exactly where to look for what. What they did beyond that is totally up to them. So we are working with them um, in Google Sites to create that consistent splash page and then um, working with them if they have sites to connect their existing sites to the back end of that. Um, questions about any of that?
red line, the higher you got, the, the, the fuller it got. And so people, you know, started to see all over the district, all over the town, like, sort of see these sort of red lines because things were filling up. So it's not, it's not an extra cost, though. So I, I mean, there isn't a significant investment required to ship it to the cloud. There's virtually no investment to ship everything up to the cloud, and it's actually going to be a cost of reduction on the back end because we're going to be able to repurpose a lot of this. As the servers age out and hit end of life, we'll just actually you know, retire them, and the ones that still have some life left in them, we'll virtualize them and redeploy them for other projects that are coming up so we don't have to purchase new servers. Huddle, the caveat to that is Huddle, which is the confidential source, there is a, a, there is a cost to that, yeah. Uh, just add one, just one more. At the high school, if you go to a one-to-one, -to -one, uh, are you going to allow the, is there any accessibility to the wireless connectors with the student devices as well? Um, don't know yet. That's okay. something that we have to kind of work on and consider. We've been thinking about that, um, like at the middle school, we've been sort of pondering that too. Okay. Um, there are ways to control access keys, okay. so they can't just randomly, you know, decide that they're going to put a, a picture of Fluffy their pet up there or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking more of the high school level. You've got, okay, you've done this project, yeah. leave it up, and let's yeah. see, let's take a look at it, and you yeah. don't have to. Yeah. Not here. Right. Yeah. And there are ways to have like rotating keys, and then you get the key, and they, yeah. they can, but they usually have to have a client on their machine. So it's a matter of us imaging the <coughs> machine with the client or being able to push it out, and that's kind of where we're at now. You mentioned the amount of training that is ongoing to seven people right now, but don't forget that we're a shared services department. So we service both the town right. and the school. So we've got folks who, um, most of my, my folks are really multi-purpose folks. They're, they're cross-trained to pretty much do everything. We have about three people that dedicate a lot of their time to the school system and are trained as trainers. But then within the school system, we have tech integrators, we have ed techs, we have different folks within each phase level that are working directly with their folks training too. And then we also have provided a lot of online training. Uh, I have to give Alicia uh, Swords and Days a lot of credit because she's been really fabulous at creating these you know, online um, PowerPoint presentations and she's got a couple of other applications she uses. And it's a great way for people to take the training when they have time. So, you know, maybe they have time at lunch or between classes or something, and they're quick 15-minute, you know, kind of lunch and learn kind of things. So, I guess this is more of a question for George. Uh, the tech integrators uh, part of the school-based staff, uh, as far as their salary is concerned, are part of the tech department? They're school-based. School-based. Based-based. Based-based. Based -based. The question, and, and this is more for you, George, but I, I don't know if Jen can chime too. How, what part of the, 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 the PLTs, are, are there any kind of cross-training things going on within the PLT groups that are tying into this feedback loop for the apps that are using or these tech docs, and how can you maybe just touch a little bit about how that's working, or is there a structure in place for that? Like, you know, I mean, like you were saying, there's a tech team in uh, high school yep. that meets once a month, but are there PLTs that are interacting across the whole project phase for their PLTs, or? I, um, and and uh, Jen, and uh, actually Joanne may uh, wish to add to this. We we have, <coughs> and what I, when Jen was saying, that some of the videos allow teachers to access the training when they're ready, or when it's more proximate to their use, and that's basically when people learn the best, is when they really need to use something. And I think the PLTs have been a great vehicle for teachers to work together in a comfortable, sort of safe environment to spend time with, with teams that are ready to move in some certain direction around an application of technology. And yeah, we do see that. I mean, it's not all teams, but there is a, there's a, and as well, that, that also works for other instructional coaches. For example, literacy specialists 
when I'm out and about, and Monique is out and about, and Joanne, we're, and we're visiting with the, um, with the PLTs on those late starts, inevitably, I am, I am seeing a math coach working with this PLT, I'm seeing a literacy coach working with this PLT, um, and, and, um, and not that there's all that many of them, but inevitably, those coaches during PLT time are completely deployed, including the, I, the IT. Um, so, so some of those PLTs are actively acting as a training platform Absolutely. for implementing the, the systems or the, the processes that are, that are being rolled up. And, and that's obviously not happening at the high school, right? Because of the, it's, or is that happening but just not as to an extent as it might be in the middle school? Well, the teachers have laptops. Um, I, it's just that they don't, they're not living and working in an environment that is, that is really um, necessarily in need of technology integration because the students don't have access to the technology. Right, so, my, so again, the answer to your question is no, you don't see that because the need is, is not there because the capacity is not there in terms of the students. We have had groups at the high school working on like Google Docs a while ago um, and you know, online collaboration This is great, and now we need <laughs> devices to yeah. actually, you know, be able to work on this. And the kids, you know, it's one thing if you can kind of herd them all down the hall and sit in a lab and work on something for an hour, and then if your hour's up and you gotta go. But then at night, when they have to finish the paper that they started working on with the four other kids in their class, and they're supposed to be in Google Docs trying to collaborate, there's no way for them to do it. So I think they sort of hit a brick wall. They found some really cool tools that they could. And I'm, I'm just trying to tie that an, another one-to-one -one discussion point into that. I would say there are things that are happening to the benefit of that technology could. Um, right now, the high school has four desktop labs. Um, they have a couple of carts of laptops and netbooks. What I, the feedback that I started receiving day one when I started working here was a lot of complaints about we can't get the time, we can't get a hold of the carts. You know, they're trying to share a very limited number of devices amongst a, a lot of um, staff and students. Um, and we have, as we just discussed, we've moved to Google. And so everything, grades three through eight now, is, everything is moving more online, moving to the cloud, moving towards collaboration. And so when you have, are used to sort of collaborating, particularly since the middle school has been doing this for a long time now, you're used to collaborating six through eight and then you get to high school and you have no device, that's a problem for you because now you have to learn an entirely new way to do your homework and your classroom projects. So just to kind of give you an overview of the process so far, uh, we do have a planning team that's been assembled and that team consists of folks from the high school, um, representatives from each department, admin from the high school, folks from central office, folks from um, my staff. We do have the high school tech team, we talked about that. Um, we meet once a month and we talk about different tech issues and they are piloting some of this equipment. Um, we did go through and conduct requirements definition sessions and this was something that um, we really wanted to do with the teachers. So we, we talked to the, the tech team and then we went into the ILT meeting and <coughs> the instructional leader team um, and we talked to them about Take what the what, whatever idea you have of the specific device. So don't think about a tablet, don't think about a laptop, don't think about a desktop, but what is it that you need? What are the basic requirements that you need to teach in your classroom? So we talked about everything from, um, you know, I need, it, it, was, it was kind of interesting because we started off talking about keyboards and about keyboarding keyboarding skills and, and well, we're kind of, well, it's really hard on an iPad to have to take up half the screen with the keyboard and, you know, and then they thought, well, no, we want tablets. A lot of them came in kind of with this idea they want tablets and then when we started talking about the keyboard need, it became really clear that they needed an integrated keyboard. They want their students to have a keyboard and have a full screen. So we talked about a lot of things like that. Each session probably lasted an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and then we uh, have, done department shares, which one of those happened that day that I um, talked about where we had sort of a district-wide um, share about different things people are using with technology.
technology. But at the high school in particular, we had the folks who were piloting the Chromebooks and the interactive projectors actually invite people, rotate people through to sh <coughs> show and tell, basically show them what they've been doing um, with the technology so far. Um, and we are planning to, we have not yet to do this, but we're planning to gather the students and the staff together. Particularly, we're gonna focus on students and staff who have used one-to-one -one in the past. So we have a number of students have moved here from different districts and the same thing with staff. We're gonna gather them and say, how is it different? What are you missing? So from the requirements definition session that I talked about, these were some of the basic requirements that they said they must have. Um, keyboard, there's, they had lists of specialty software. So for example, in the science department, they use ProWare. ProWare is a, it's sort of an analysis, right? It's an analysis software. There's, there's special peripherals that they have to plug into the machine to be able to collect data. And then the, the software itself actually, I think, helps them analyze the data. Um, and, then, and so each department kind of has things like that, which we already own. Um, they wanted to be able to record audio and video. More and more, they're going online, and they are um, Skyping the classrooms around the world. They're sharing information. They're collaborating with you know, other classrooms, particularly, um, I don't know if any of your kids were involved in the iBook project, but that was something where they collaborated with um, classrooms basically all over the world as this book kind of traveled along and they shared data. Um, they wanted at least two USB ports because at any given time you might need a mouse, you might need these peripherals in science, something, you know, anything. Um, Built-in webcams, HDMI ports in case you do need to connect out to, to a, a projector. Um, headphone jacks because some of the testing that takes place you actually have to have headphones. Um, they did want to be able to save to a hard drive. I, I think really for, where that was going was they wanted to be able to save work somewhere. Um, a seven hour battery life minimum so that there wasn't going to be a lot of having to plug in, swap out batteries during the day. Multimedia card reader, reader. Um, they did want sleeves, case, some kind of, they didn't want like big backpacks or big bags that the kids were not going to have to carry in, it to, in addition to their backpacks. They wanted sort of sleeves that they could stick this in and then kind of put it in their bag. Um, they wanted it to be secure. Um, ability, they did want the ability to charge during the day. So what that looks like, you know, is, is sort of optional, but they wanted some place or some way to recharge if they had to. Then there were some nice to have. Um, one of them was stylus. So if they, one of the, the things that particularly they talked about was the ability to sort of annotate um, papers or annotate other um, documents that kids would find online, but they wanted to be able to do that um, via handwriting. Um, and then Skype and Google Hangouts. So these were just sort of the basic requirements. There was a really long list, I kind of boiled them down to the, the basics here. So what we did was we took those requirements <coughs> and we went out to all of our various vendors and we matched up uh, specific devices to those requirements. And this is kind of a list of you know what we came up with. As you can see, it's relatively close. Um, I based this primarily on about 1,300 <coughs> devices. Um, and what I did was extrapolate that out over six years. Because to me, it's not just the initial cost that you have to consider, but you have to consider the cyclical replacement um, and what it's going to cost to maintain. I threw in everything. I do have um, much more detailed sheets that we'll share with you later. <coughs> the proposal. Um, but we took into consideration everything from, you know, extra power adapters to the cases to the chargers to, you know, everything. Everything you would need. So what this looks like, um, you can see sort of the annualized cost. And I'll just kind of go through each option because they're a little different from each other. Again, we took the requirements, and this is kind of how the, this is a more visual um, look at which um, devices meet which requirements. So the HP 210G1, <coughs> I had some of these devices in the car that I wanted to share with you, um, but when we actually made the proposal, we can bring those in. The, the 210G1 is an 11.6 inch screen, 
So one of the things that the teachers really said was the problem was the portability of the device. They didn't want the knees, you know, that weighs like 14 pounds. Um, they wanted something that was lighter, uh, that would be more portable, that the kids could easily carry class to class, or if they had to go out to the field and you know, do a project out there, they could, they could handle it out there. So we looked at some smaller, um, they're, they're full-fledged laptops, but they're kind of netbook size. So in, I'm just curious, because while you're running through all these, which one of these, if any, are like the middle school devices, the HP, I don't know what they're, or the four threes? Yeah. Um, obviously through HP, we do get discounted pricing because we go through them for MLTI. So we did kind of um, take a look at what they had to, to offer. The thing about um, the HP 210G1, it is the only one on this list that is touch screen touchscreen was one of the key functionalities that the teachers decided they really needed. I can't remember if I actually included that in the requirements list, but um, you can see it, you know, four gigs of RAM. Most of these devices have plenty of RAM, plenty of hard drive space, um, an i3 or higher processor. This one has 8.1 Pro, or we can downgrade it to 7 if people aren't ready to go to Windows 8. So I don't know, are you guys familiar with the difference? Okay. Aren't they coming out with 10? They are, yes. Which is gonna take care of a lot of the problems that people have had in trying to ship from the one. Yeah, so Windows 8 is tile-based because Windows 8 was built for touch screens. So if you think about the way an iPad looks or you know other tablets, it's that touch screen capability. Windows 8 was built specifically for that. It does not have um, the snazzy little like start Windows button at the bottom that everybody's used to. So you can click on that, your file structure pops up, and it doesn't have that. And so people, users are really frustrated with it. Um, there are clamshells that you can download that provide the Windows 7 feel, but then you're kind of like, well, why do I even do this? I just get Windows 7. Um, so yes, they are talking about Windows 10, and they're talking about sort of a lot of people leapfrogging over eight and just going directly to ten because there's rebellion. What's the rest of the district in the town? Seven. Seven. Yeah. Um, so that's just sort of something to think about because while it does meet all the requirements, we could roll it back to seven. And one of the things that we talked about was maybe we do go with a touch screen because if you think long term, if we're thinking of cycles of you know five and six years, there is going to be a point where we're going to go touch screen. I mean, it's just going to be, that's the way everything's going. So do we want to just have the device and be prepared and upgrade the OS when it comes out and it's ready and people are used to it and people are kind of demanding it? Just something to think about. The Probe 440 is what we have at the middle school and at Wentworth. So the nice thing about this device, although it's a full 14-inch screen, um, it's a little heavier than the other devices, it's what the kids are used to. So they are going to be very familiar with this device. They'll have to use this from grades three through eight, and when they move to the high school, it's not gonna be a big shock to them. 14-inch um, screen, like I said, sort of the same thing. It has a Win, uh, Win 7 OS. Um, it is almost five pounds, so that's something to consider. I say 4.6 there, but when you start adding on all the other you know, components to it, it's probably about five, five and a half pounds. Um, they say nine hour battery life. I don't really think that's a nine hour battery life. It's nine hour battery life maybe if you just have the lid closed and you're kind of carrying it around with you the whole time. If you're actually using it, I would say you probably are gonna get about five to six hour maybe. Which, is that about what you're seeing? Mm -hmm. Robert, yeah. yeah. The Lenovo ThinkPad 11E20E9 is kind of the same thing as the HP 210G1 except it does not have a touch screen but it is a smaller version, it's an 11 inch screen. Um, it's a little bit heavier than the HP 210, but it has pretty much all the same thing. Win 7 OS, because it's not touch screen, they do guarantee a six and a half hour runtime battery. They are coming out with different lithium ion batteries too that promise much longer lives. I, I mean, I don't know, I can't guarantee it, but maybe. Um, and then we have the Samsung Series 3 Chromebook. I kind of back and loaded this because you all know what a Chromebook looks like, right? They're small, they're thin, they're very portable, 
But the thing about Chromebooks is they're made to connect directly to your Google Drive. So there's really no hard drive storage capacity at all. This one happens to have a 16 gig hard drive, which is you know what, what's on your phone, basically. So it could maybe store <coughs> something uploaded or something, but it's not gonna store software, documents, data, Excel spreadsheets, or whatever. So in talking to the teachers and going through these two um, uh, functional requirement definition sessions, what we found is they really do need access to the software, for now anyway. So what we talked about is creating a virtual desktop interface on the back end. And essentially what that would be is if you took your Chromebook and you simply browsed into a desktop like what you would see on a regular laptop. We can then, on the back end, load that desktop with any of the specialized software they need. It would look like a regular desktop, it would have Microsoft Office, it would have all the tools and software that they need. Um, we priced this out at 250 concurrent seats on the virtual desktop interface, which I think will more than suffice. Um, we did go out and visit Wyndham. Wyndham has a BDI solution. Um, we did watch this used um, in conjunction with a Chromebook, and we watched it used in conjunction with a full-fledged laptop, and both seemed to connect seamlessly. Um, there was very little, if any, latency. It connected right to a desktop. They had, you can set up your user profiles. So while Chris might see one set of software, um, Dr. Chris might see a completely different, whatever's in his profile, he'll see, whatever's in your profile, he'll see. So we can set that up. Um, there is a significant initial cost to purchasing and configuring the VDI, but the long-term maintenance is much less because the Chromebooks are much less. So it's sort of, you know, there's a lot to kind of consider here. Um, um, so we're still kind of going through the proposal. Um, we're still talking to people. David has actually arranged a group of students and teachers. We'll be talking to them and getting some ideas, and then we'll be coming back to you. I just wanted to let you guys know that, because I know you're probably getting a ton of questions from the community, too, about what's going on. Where are you guys? One of the things I would like to see is, is I see the hardware cost here. I'd like to see the overall evaluated cost in the system, whether it's adding the additional 250 seats, or if there's other maintenance issues, let's say, Devices. So the hardware costs obviously are a big chunk of that, but if, if we're going to end up having cost differential somewhere else, like we now need a separate tech to run the Samsung Chromebook versus the 440s that we already have, mm -hmm. and there's a different training structure associated with it. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's just I'd like to see that overall investment costs, not just the hardware side. Or is that, that reflected is, in here? Yeah, like, and okay. I'll just show you. Um, just to give you an idea, I didn't print these out for everybody because we're actually still working on them. Um, but the way that I came up with those costs is we did different worksheets where, so for example, this is, I included all of the line items that we could possibly need. I think we have everything in here. I say that and that probably just doomed me to getting something. Um, but then we took a look, so on the back side of the sheet, we took a look at the sort of revenue and expenditures that we would get from the maintenance program. So obviously we would have a maintenance program. Parents would, we think, I mean this would be part of the proposal, pay something into it just like they do at the middle school. Um, and so that fund would take care of some of the gaps that we have. Um, I also have again extrapolated out the replacement numbers and just given you sort of a visual of the number because at any given time if we do this in overlapping cycles there will be a number of devices that are not covered at all by warranty but I do think since we've backloaded those into years four five and six I think that we can take care of that out of the maintenance fund and I think once we get HP certified and if we decide to go with one of the other options we can also, most of these companies have certifications. We can do some of the repairs ourselves. So again, I didn't put these out for everybody because they're not, they're not complete. We're still working on some of the numbers, but it does, those numbers
numbers are fairly comprehensive. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I just wonder if you I see you pull out in three of them is getting from six inches to four inch. And I think it's a kind of the the effect of his eyes, you know, how difficult it's for them to work, you know, you know look at because I have a very good day and it's very small.
take that number and then I always add on an extra 5% because just because there's 14% that are free to reduce, there's probably another 5% that are kind of right on the line that can't afford to go out and buy a $500 piece of equipment. So now you've got 20% of your school population who can't afford a device. So we're saying to them, too bad, you have to. Well, then, you know, for the rest of the waiting to buy more devices, we say we own the system requirement. And the ones that cannot do it, you know, we don't ask, you know, 30 percent, but that's still a huge saving to the district. If we can make that system work, you know, you say, oh, well, you have to do everybody connect to, you know, Google Drive, Google Drive, or whatever, you know. The, the problem, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I don't, I don't disagree with it, but the problem is really going to be the reality of trying to connect 1,300 people every day, all day long. And you can say to them, here's your system requirement, and I'm telling you, right off the bat, you're gonna get 25% of the people coming in that don't have the system requirement, but have something close to it, so they think it'll be okay. Well, it's not Windows 7, it's Windows 8, but won't everything work on Windows 8? Because if it's Windows 8, it's the next version up from Windows 7, mm -hmm. is everything compatible? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right off the bat, I think we're just gonna have people who are gonna say, well, it's close enough, let's just wing it and see if it works. And it's not gonna work, and what you're gonna run into is a problem in the classrooms where teachers are not able to actually start their, their classes. If, if I can, just to pass something out to you, because this board has been concerned about the fact that our high school kids don't have computers. And in the fall, we were very concerned when we met with Cumberland County up at the convention, seeing what we thought was, wow, are we the only ones? So I decided to call the state yesterday and find out exactly what's going on across the state as well as in Cumberland County. So what I've got here for you is an opportunity for you to see what the data looks like for Cumberland County, but what's going on in the high schools and middle schools in this entire county <coughs> for MLTI. And what you're going to see is that every single high school, with the exception <coughs> of Scarborough and, and there was one other and Brunswick High School. All the other high schools have one-to-one -one computing through MLTI for their school system. Five years ago, 23,700 main high school students had a one-to-one -one computer, and none of them were in our high school. That blows my mind. Five years ago. I totally agree with you. I think right now, you know, the students really need to want to walk, really need to have uh, access to laptops, which is portable devices we can work with, because that would, you know, improve the uh, chance to learn a lot of things, doing homework. So that's right, and that's the important piece here, is not, the computer is just the tool. The value here is in marrying that content and that curriculum to the computer, to the use of the computer as the tool. It's what is it that changes in that classroom, in that subject, that is all of what this is about. That's all about what this is about. It's just a tool, it expands understanding, it's much richer, it's much <coughs> deeper, it offers layers and layers of knowledge that we can provide. Our district has programs, already has the technology piece to it. Our high school kids can't use it. We bought the programs already. So and that's I think the important part of what <coughs> we're talking about with BYOD, because we do have the programs, we already have the applications, people are bringing in their own devices, we can't load that software to their machines. We would still have to have some kind of virtual desktop environment on the back end. And that virtual desktop 
soft environment, like I said, is a significant cost up front to implement. So at that point, you're halfway there towards having a consistent device that you offer and knowing for sure that every single child is going to have a device. Do you know what the state requirements are for the computer-based testing? Because if we're on a bring-your-own device, how are we going to ensure that everybody can get on to the state website or however they're at, however they're are executing those exams or administering those exams, is that? Yeah, is that we, we've already made sure that the, the basic requirements are met. So with the ProBook 440s. I know we will, but I'm just saying that if you do an, a BYOD type of arrangement, oh. uh, there's no guarantee, yeah. there's no way to guarantee that you can even access that system yeah. to uh, have that test administered. Right, exactly. Um, I mean, if we were to do some kind of BYOD like that, we would still probably have to have computer labs We'd still have to, like, for you know, the science department, they need that room where they need the, the clients loaded to be able to connect the peripheral devices. Y you would still have to have parts of laptops there. You know, it sort of kind of almost defeats the purpose. Are those tests unique based it or what kind of system, um, what kind of base can I have? The state testing is browser based, but you have to go in through a secure mm -hmm. portal. So you do have to have a client loaded to the device, is what we understand now. We're still learning about it, but.